Good afternoon, students. Sorry for this uh, change of plans with uh, the loss of this first hour. Uh, I wrote on Facebook, I think, that uh, I had to go to a board meeting. I, I really did, but uh, I had to do something else instead today, so I've actually been here, but uh, I didn't see any point in trying to kind of reschedule once more. Okay, so In any case, I think uh, the main uh, point of today is to go through this exercise, and I believe we should be able to do that within these two hours. So we will start on the next chapter again tomorrow. There is a lecture tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Is that from 9.15 or 12.15? 12.15, ah, that's nice. Due to this, I, was, I managed to, to go to a lecture before this hour. Uh, a Hungarian colleague of mine, he's working on the with drones. You know what a drone is? Yeah, these kind of small things that fly in the air which you can use. And he's uh, working with, uh, with flocks of drones. Do you know birds when they fly? They kind of do it in some kind of coordinated manner. Have you seen that? Yeah, they, they, we say they fly in flocks, don't we? Do you know why they do that? Yeah, they want to minimize uh, the energy use, don't they? So to avoid this air resistance, they only, uh, only the front bird in some sense kind of takes the the push and then they're kind of lining up either in the Wii or some other kind of formation to, to avoid this, uh, this air resistance. And of course the reason why it would be interesting to look at, uh, at the drones in the flock could be related to that matter, but there could also be other reasons for it. Uh, the idea is of course to have a system where you can kind of coordinate individual drones by themselves and that's the key thing to this what he's working on that you kind of distribute the decisions to each drone so he only kind of monitors these other drones and then then he makes or he or he or it makes decisions in a sense so it's kind of like a uh, intelligent way of simulating uh, these kind of activity so it was really interesting i must say but today uh, we will talk about something far less interesting which is microeconomics and uh, the first exercise. So let's take it up. <coughs> so we go here. Uh, why do this thing always come up? Choose add-ons. Maybe if I choose add-ons here, if I then it never comes up again. Huh? That should be. Does it work? No. Um. Okay, I have to move on. Uh, maybe we should choose English again here. Oh, that was wrong. Okay, uh, I have put up a solution to the exercise. I think I did. Let's see if it's there. Um, solution, under 300 solutions. Uh, yeah, this, you see the solution is here. We might uh, have a copy of it available, perhaps. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you see, the actual solution is available. Okay, in a fairly formal manner. So uh, I will just go go through this on the board. I think. Okay. So let's uh, move back to the exercise text. These are uh, exercises from the textbook. Uh, copied up here and uh, scanned in. Okay. Um, exercise one says suppose the demand curve for a product is given by and then we have this expression for the demand curve I might perhaps write it on the board 
Exercise one. Given I at the mount curve and this demand curve uh, looks like this 300 minus 2p plus 4i if you recall what we said about demand curves in the early parts of our lectures we said that they really depend are depending on more than price okay so this is an example of actually a two-dimensional demand curve where both price as well as I, which perhaps is average income, is a part of the demand curve. So this is actually a two-variable function. We are normally used to these kind of demand curves. Okay. Uh, the supply curve, however, is given in the normal normal manner. Supply curve uh, as Q equal to three P minus fifty. And in A. And B here, we are asked to find the so called market clearing price and quantity bundle. That means that we are asked to find the equilibrium solution, aren't we? So if our demand curve is like this and our supply curve is, is if like this, A and B wants us to find this point for two different cases. One case where I equals 25, and another case where I equals 50. And then finally, we should kind of draw a graph to illustrate the answers. Uh, there are many ways of doing this. Uh, I normally prefer to do it mathematically. And of course, to, to find an intersection between two curves is just to put that Q equal to that Q, or actually this expression equal to that expression, uh, to, to solve in principle both for A and B. So if you do this at the same time, and B, try to do it efficiently, then we should take Q from the mount curve, curve and equate it to Q from supply curve. That's the easy way to do this. And that produces the following equation, 300 minus 2P plus 4i equal to 3p minus 50 okay and now there are two ways either we can kind of put in these two values for i and solve it twice or alternatively perhaps we can try to solve it as a function of i can't we that's that's possible here so if we take this p on the right hand side and this minus 50 on the left hand side then there is 300 left from before plus 50 the minus 2p is moved there and we keep the 4i here and we end up by 3p plus 2p don't we you agree and of course we can draw together here 300 plus 50 is 350 plus 4i should equal 5p and then of course it's just to divide by 5 to find the market clearing price now as a function of income okay so this produces what we often put the star on to to mark that we kind of have reached the final solution here so to speak will be 350 plus 4i over 5 Okay, that is the price. And of course, we need to find the quantity as well, and that's straightforward. Either to substitute the equilibrium price into the demand curve or the supply curve. It doesn't matter which one because it's the same point we're aiming for here. Okay, of course, it's perhaps easiest to enter it into this one. So we can, if this is star, we can now put if this is two stars, put two stars into one star yeah and then we get q star which then is 3 times p which is this expression minus 
minus 50. Okay? And then, of course, as the exercise tells us, we should perhaps enter these two values for I know, 25 and 50, into this and into this. Then we get two points for these two different situations. Uh, if you look at the solution here, I've done it differently. There I do this a little bit less advanced, so to speak. So I start by just entering i equals to 25. Then I get 300 minus 2p plus 4 times 25 equal to the supply curve 3p minus 50. Then I solve for p and I get the p-value of 90. I just then do the same structure. I put it back into the supply curve with p equals 90 and then it's 3 times 90 minus 50 as you can see here and then you end up with this first equilibrium point of p equal to 90 and q equal to 220. Uh, yes? One question. Uh, it says in the where a is average income means in thousands of dollars. Yeah. It just it don't do 25,000 dollars to use 25. Right. Does that matter? I'm just asking, you don't like, uh, because you find the illusion, it's 19. Yeah, of course, what it means then is that the price here is not, uh, what did we get? The price here is not. Nine, we get 19. The price here is not 90, it's $90,000. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's what it means. Okay, but it doesn't kind of affect the calculations here. Of course, if, if there were other, other stuff here, if... Uh, the price we kind of measure differently than in thousands of dollars, then we have to do some conversion here. But that's not necessary. But uh, it means, as you say, Farnar. Is that the right name? Yeah, Farnar. Farnar? Yeah. You say it fast in Iceland. Farnar? Yeah. Yeah. And he is also Farnar, isn't he? Yeah. But I don't know where he went out. I'm just trying you to memorize your names, okay? And then I do the second step, of course, in the same way. In B here, progressing as above, we then just substitute 50 instead of 25. So this 25 is, is changed to 50 here. Then we get, of course, a different, uh, different solution here. And it turns out that uh, the P star is 110 or $110,000 then to be embarrass embarrassingly correct. And Q star is found just by entering P star again in the supply curve. And it turns out to be 280. <coughs> Okay, at C we should draw these. Okay, these are all straight lines given various values for these i variable, the income variable. So as long as we put a number into i, we can draw a straight line. And if you look at the first figure here, this one, it kind of uh, shows what happens here. Uh, of course, when the income increases from 25 up to 50, you should, should expect an outward shift in the demand curve. So each customer is, is able to buy more. And this is exactly what we see. We see the supply curve here as the blue size. It says here, consider a competitive market. That information tells us that we are still in a situation where this crossing between demand and supply means the solution to the market. Okay, that's that is the meaning of this. For which the quantities demanded and supplied per year at various prices are given as follows. So instead of having the mathematical functional description, now we have a numerical description just by points. Okay? So if the price is $60 for this market, whatever it might be, then demand is 22 million or something and supply is 14 million or something. Then when price increases, you would expect demand to go down, which is thus, thus, and supply to go up, which is also thus. Okay, then it moves from 22 to 20, downwards in that direction, and up from 14 to 16 in the supply direction. So uh, still the same pattern, moving up to 100, then it decreases, increases here, and up to 120, decreases on the demand side, and increases on the supply side. So you see that uh, 
if you think about uh, plotting things here, it seems like there is an up upward pattern on the supply curve and a downward pattern on the demand curve, as it should be. Now, if you look at these numbers, uh, is it possible to see whether the supply and demand curve are linear by these numbers? Can you see that? Ah, oh. a phone. I just have to take this one, I'm sorry. Uh. <coughs> no. Plus 45, what country is that? No, no, you are, are from a plus 45 country? <laughs> Maybe it's Sweden? You think it's Denmark? Who is calling me from Denmark? Interesting. Ah. Okay, it's very easy to check whether a point set is linear or not. And in order to do that, you need to remember that if we have a linear function, then we know or should know that the derivative is b, isn't it? This derivative of that one is 0 and the derivative of this one is b. So it means that the derivative is constant, doesn't it? It doesn't change when the x changes. And that means that if you see a stream of numbers and if you take differences between pairs of them, you should end up with the same number. You see here, 60 minus 80 minus 60 is 20, 100 minus 80 is 20, 120 minus 100 is 20, 22 minus 20 is 2, 20 minus 18 is 2, 18 minus 16 is 2. So this is constant, isn't it? The demand curve is constant. Supply curve as well, isn't it? 20 minus 18, 2, 18 minus 16, 2, 16 minus 14, 2. So these are actually two linear curves, points on two linear curves. Of course, we really don't know this because there are points we don't have and in between these points, this kind of constancy could have been changed, okay? But it at least seems so. Now what we're asked to do here is to calculate the price elasticity of demand when the price is 80 and when the price is 100. So we want to, the exercise wants to test whether we are able to calculate price elasticities of demand for two different price points. And uh, if you recall this elasticity formula, uh, it should be fairly evident that these elasticities could kind of depend on the price. They don't have to be the same uh, uh, depending on the price. So. Uh, the idea is perhaps to get two different numbers here then for two different prices. To be able to do this is just a matter of knowing this formula. And if you return to the... What is this? Return to the solution, we may go through it. It's relatively straightforward here. So let's look at the solution text here. I'm going too far. This is another solution, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, it was the wrong wrong file. Must be another one. This one it should be. I am getting all these text messages, probably. It's a message for, for the, the Danish person who called me. Yes, it is. Okay. Just a moment. Sorry about this. You see, this phone is in it behaves that if I don't look at an SMS, then it keeps on playing. Do you have an iPhone? To remind me, of course, but uh, at the moment I don't need this reminder. So then I have to look at it. Of course, it's probably possible to tune it off. Maybe you know. Does anybody have an iPhone 5S here? Yeah, is it possible to turn off this constantly annoying reminder? It is. Okay, you can show me afterwards. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, to calculate price elasticities given discrete data leads to the application of the following formula. So, of course, you need to remember this formula. Okay, that, that's a necessity to perform this exercise. And there are two versions of this. Okay, the, the discrete version where you put delta Q over delta P in the final parts of equation five, and it's the continuous version where it's the derivative of Q with respect to P, which is the which is the alternative. 
then what we're interested in here is to find it at p equals 80 okay then p is 80 isn't it so we have that number p is 80 so that produces 80 on top of the first fraction here of course then we need to look at the corresponding quantity from the table and the corresponding quantity if p equals what was it 80 I'm, 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 my memory is getting bad p is 80 uh, then it we can look in the table for p equals 80 and see that uh, the demand in that case is 20 okay so then we have both numbers in the first part of this fraction p is 80 q is 20 that that produces 80 divided by 20 then we need to look at the change in q and then of course uh, we there are two options here either we can go from 80 in that direction or from 80 in that direction it doesn't really matter in what which way we go now does it due to the fact that the, the, dis the difference is the same here so if you look at the change in price for instance between 80 and 60 the difference is 80 minus 60 which is 20 isn't it the change in quantity would be 20 minus 22 which would be minus 2 isn't it we need to keep track of the signs here and that's how it should be isn't it when price goes down quantity goes up so they are kind of opposite one has a positive sign the other should have a negative sign and that produces of course the answer which is given in the solution here we get minus 2 for the quantity change and plus 20 for the price change exactly the what change from the previous price yeah it, or it, it doesn't uh, yeah, from 80 you start from the price point and then you look at either you go 260 or up to 100 it doesn't matter here does it uh, we're trying to find the demand right yeah, yeah and you go from 60 no i go from 80 and then i look back to 60. Yeah, okay, so it's then i go from 20 then i look back to 22. if i did it the other way around going from 80 up to 100 from 20 down to 18 i will get exactly the same answer this fraction will be not changed so it doesn't matter in what way you go in this case so that produces our first price the amount price it's often called a price elasticity here okay sometimes it's called a demand elasticity it means the same okay be aware of that the correct term is perhaps to use the demand elasticity as we look at the demand curve so we end up by uh, calculating 80 times minus 2 over 20 times 20 so it's 8 divided by 2 which is 4 times 2 which is 8 over 20 which is perhaps 0 0.4 isn't it yeah so it's a minus in head due to this minus two years. so it's a a sign which we would expect on a price elasticity okay it should move in the other way if we increase the price then the demand should go down down or the other way around this was for price equals 80 then of course we we presumably get a different number when we start at the price equal 100 and of course the reason for that is that the first fraction here changes doesn't it the second one does not change because the curve is linear but the starting point here will change so the latter part of the fraction here remains the same if we start from 100 100 minus 80 is 20 20 minus 8 or 18 minus 20 is minus 2 so that fraction is kept but when we start from 100 of course price now is suddenly 100 not 80 as it was previously and the amount is now 18 not 20 as it was and that's the reason for the change in the value of the price elasticity so we we keep the final part of the fraction but of course have to accordingly change the first part so then we end up with still a negative number as we should do but slightly larger uh, in absolute value compared to the previous value of 0 0.4 now it's 0 0.555 or if we stick to two decimals minus 0 0.56 um, Uh, there's nothing wrong in writing 0 0.6 here if one prefers that the number of decimals is nothing I, I care a lot about okay the same formula of course applies for the supply elasticities but the, the main difference is that then of course you use the supply curve so you have to move from this part of the table <coughs> oh what happened here into this part as well as this part oh the idea was that this one should be kept but it didn't stick it seems <laughs> so
So instead of using these two columns, we have to use this column as well as this column. And then, of course, it's the same procedure. Straightforward. Really no big challenges here, I would expect. So then you end up with 0 0.5 in the price equals to 80 case and 0 0.56 in the price equal to 100 case. Of course, the final fraction keeps the same again. Uh, we, we, we noted before we started here that the difference, all, po all possible differences were, were 2 and 20 in these two curves. But now, of course, when we look at the supply curve, it is moving in the same, <coughs> same direction as price. When price increases, so that does also supply. So then we should expect positive numbers for for these elasticities. And, and that is exactly what we get. We get 0 0.5 in the price equals to 80 case and 0 0.555 and so on in the price equal to 100 case. Okay, any questions to this one? This was the B, right? This was the B, yes. This was the B. It says B here on top, I think. Actually, it starts here at A. No. This was A. Sorry, this was A. Uh, I think, wasn't it? B. It was B. Yeah, it was. Yeah, sorry. I uh, I have been sloppy with my. Sorry, there is an error in the here. It should state A here. That's correct. And then down here it should say B. So there's a lack of a B here. Okay. You can correct that yourself. Okay. Very nice, Farnar. You are very precise here. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And then it's C. <laughs> what are the equilibrium price and quantity? Oh, that's that's very easy, isn't it? We know that the equilibrium price and quantity are found where supply equals demand, don't we? And there are some numbers here. Here's demand 22, here it's 14. Now they are not equal. 20, 16, they are not still not equal. 18 and 18, they are equal. Okay. So the, the equilibrium price is 100 and the equilibrium demand is 18. Okay? That was easy. The equilibrium is obtained when the quantity supplied equals the quantity demanded. This happens for Q star equals to 18 as observed in the table. The accompanying equilibrium price is then P star equals to 100. Alternatively, of course, if one kind of feels to do things inefficiently, you could plot the demand and supply curves as points to observe the equilibrium. And I did this in a figure here, which is here, where you see these four points are plotted and you see the intersection is in this point. It should perhaps be a blue superimposed point on this red one. Don't you think that would be nicer? So I should be able to get some transparency in this point. I was not able to do that at this, that time. Maybe I know how to do this in Excel. No. So that was C. Okay. Questions? This is too easy for you, isn't it? You know, I always observe your reactions and then at the end I make the exam. Okay. So if you kind of act as if everything is simple, then the exam becomes very difficult. That was way too hard. It was way too hard, yeah. yeah. There you see the Americans, they know all about strategy and tactics, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> at this point it doesn't help. When I have revealed the secret, then you can say whatever you like. So, uh, sorry for this. Now, I, I don't think the exam will be very hard to take this year. It will uh, be as it always is, if there is any always in this course. This is actually only the second time I teach it. Here, I've taught microeconomics many times before in other cities. But uh, it, it's some years since I did it. Okay, uh, let's move back to the, the exercise text. Question D. Suppose the government sets a price ceiling of $80. Do you know what the price ceiling is? You know what the ceiling is? That this is a ceiling, isn't it? Kind of. Something is called ceiling in English and outside it's called roof. Isn't that correct, Eric? Yeah. In Norway we only have one word for this. We call it talk. On the inside, 
as well as the outside. How is it in other countries? What about China? Do you have different words for this part of the roof or the ceiling as well as the outer part? Okay. What about Icelandic? Do you have only one word for roof? Well, this one is not the same as the roof. And there are different names. What are the names in Icelandic for this? Loft. Loft? Or thak. Yeah, but loft is something else. Loft is in between. It's the space in between here. So if you have it, oh, okay, we have to take, we have to do this, okay? Okay. Here is a house, okay? It has a roof. This from outside is the roof. Isn't that correct, Eric? Yes. Yeah. And inside here we call this a ceiling, don't we? But we also call this a ceiling, don't we? Inside, if this is space in here. Yeah. Yeah. So this is also a ceiling, but in Iceland, just as in Norway, this space here is called a loft. The space is the loft. My question is not about the space, it's about the inside of the roof, roof here. Yeah, the inside. Yeah? It's just talk. No. What do you call it in Icelandic? Talk. 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 Yeah, it's just talk. So you talk. see? Yeah. <laughs> so Icelandic and Norwegian are very poor languages, okay? Compared to English, which has much more words for, the, for this. On the other hand, we have a lot of words for snow, don't we? Oh, no, that's, that's just a lie. The Eskimos, they have a lot of words for snow. Okay. So a price ceiling is kind of a maximal price, isn't it? It kind of tells you that the price should not be abo above this level. So it uh, is some kind of regulation which governments sometimes do. They don't want to expose the consumers to to too high a price. Okay. Maybe the consumers are poor, so they try to regulate the market by limiting the price at a certain value, hopefully in such a way that the people that should buy the product are able to buy it. Okay. That's the, the main idea. These are uh, often called subsidies. Okay. It's something you kind of, you take money and move it into the customer side from the government point of view. In this case, of course, the customers are able to buy products at a cheaper price than the market equilibrium would provide. So no, in this case, the ceiling price is set to 80. And we already know here that the equilibrium price is 100, don't we? So it is a real ceiling price. It's kind of below the price the equilibrium uh, should have. So then it moves on the exercise. Will there be a shortage? And if so, how large will it be? There will be a shortage, won't it? What we're doing now is that if you think about this figure here, the equilibrium point is at 100, isn't it? And we put a price ceiling here at 80. Okay, these are the suppliers, these are the demanders. Demanders would like to have this amount at this price. Suppliers only produce this point at this price. So this is the shortage, isn't it? This is the amount which is put to the market too little. The suppliers will only produce this amount, but the demanders are <coughs> eager to buy much more. So it's this distance here we're trying to calculate in this exercise. That should be straightforward, shouldn't it? Uh, if we return to the solution, it's uh, given here. I seem to recall. If uh, sorry, a, a typo. If a price ceiling of 80 is set, the demand in quantity is 20. As you can see from the table, of course, if you put the price to 80, it's the demand quantity is 20 and the supply is 16. So it's straightforward to calculate the, the shortage by t just taking 20 minus 16, which is 4. So it's a shortage in supply here of 4 million units uh, if you if you are correct okay so it's 4 million units too little put into the market okay questions now the idea of this one is first to give there is the idea is to do some exercises related to 
general equilibrium to find it, to, manipula to manipulate it, uh, to be able to calculate some elasticities either in the continuous case or in the discrete case. Of course in the continuous case we didn't have any questions related to elasticities, which we had in the discrete case. Okay, then there is another exercise here. In 2010, Americans smoked 315 billion cigarettes or 15.75 billion packs of cigarettes. That's a lot of cigarettes. What is the price of 315 billion cigarettes? What's the price of 15.75 billion packs of cigarettes in the States today, Eric? What's the price of a 20 package of cigarettes? Uh, what about you, Matt? Do you know? They're like four dollars. Four dollars? Yeah. That's kind of cheap. <laughs> Do you know the price in Norway? Like a hundred something kroner, I think. Yeah, it's about hundred, I think. Although I have stopped smoking many years ago, I still uh, try to look at the price. So it's it's kind of in Norway to buy 15.75 billion packs of cigarettes, you'd have to spend 15.75 times 10 to the power of 9th, which is a billion, isn't it? Times the price, which is 100 crowns per package. This is the same as 10 to the power of 2. 9 plus 2 is 11, so it's 1.575 crowns times 10 to the power of 12. This is a big number. So you see, uh, Americans, they in 2010 they used a lot of money on cigarettes it seems of course there are many people living in the US isn't it how much is it 200 300 300, 300 million just like Russia around there are also around 300 I think far behind China of course how many people is living in China these days 3 billion 4 billion how many yeah 1.4 okay I was very <laughs> I thought there was a lot more Chinese <coughs> sorry about that no offense uh, the average ret retail price including taxes was about dollar five per pack okay you were a bit low there Matt it seems to be five dollars a pack in 2010 so maybe it's even do you think it has gone down since 2010 so it's just down to four now Oh, you have cheap cigarettes, and they are they are both cheap and expensive cigarettes. Yeah. yeah. That's like the name brand. Okay. Statistical studies have shown that the price elasticity of demand is 0 0.4, and the price elasticity of supply is 0 0.5. Okay. So now we we have the equilibrium quantity, don't we? Which is 15.75 billion packs, and we can choose whether to to make our um, calculations in packs or in single cigarettes. In that case, we would have to use 315 if you were to use it in single cigarettes. And then we have the price, which is dollar five per package. Actually, it seems obvious that we should stick to packs then, because we have the right package price. Even. I really don't know whether these packages are measured in tens or twenties or whatever. And we have the elasticities, both for demand and supply. And then in A, it says using this information, derive linear demand and supply curves for the cigarette market. Okay, we did an example of this, didn't we, in the textbook? So this is just a copy of that example, basically, but different numbers, of course. So let's look at uh, how it's sold. The equilibrium solution is given in the text, as I said. Q star is 15.75 packs, and then I, uh, I just drop this billion. Okay, that's not necessary. We can add that later on, if you like, to make it easier. And uh, five. So there's five dollars a price and 15.75 billion packs. Furthermore, both demand and supply elasticities are given as ED equals to minus 0 0.4 and ES equals to 0 0.5. I tend to use uh, an index D to, to, to denote the demand elasticity and an index S to denote the supply elasticity. That should be to, to be able to separate these two terms. There are two different numbers here. And given this information, we are asked to derive linear demand curves and supply demand and supply curves. And then, of course, we have to kind of make an expression 
for the demand curve and then I use letters A and B for these unknowns in the linear demand curve and then I use letters C and D for the unknowns in the supply curve and then I implicitly assume here that the demand curve is rotated or should you say facing in the right way so when I use A minus BP then I assume that the B is a positive number then it should go down okay and in the same manner in 11 I assume that C and D are positive numbers meaning that it's going up So, as it says, we need to find, actually what we're trying to do, what we actually do here is that we, we, we kind of put up four equations in four unknowns, isn't it? To find these four A, B, C, and D. And, and the point is then to be able to express these four equations. And we have information related to two elasticities that produces two equations. And we have the equilibrium point which also produces two equations. So we have these four equations. In this case, of course, we have to revert back to the continuous version of the elasticity formula as our demand and supply curves are given as continuous functions not as points as in the previous exercise but I see that the time is come for a break so let's take a break and then continue in the next and today final hour So we can turn off this one. Ah. <laughs>